Turn with me to Acts chapter 3. So we're continuing in this series on, on the book of Acts, and that's where we've uh, uh, written and arrived, 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 arrived. Um, we'll be there for a little bit. We're going to be there through the spring, I think. And uh, we'll, we're just going to make our way through the book. We're going to take some pretty large chunks as we go. And uh, this is not by far the, the longest, but we're going to be looking at all of chapter 3 today. <clears throat> Now, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour, and a man, lame from birth, was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple that is called the Beautiful Gate, to ask alms of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. And Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them, but Peter said, I have no silver or gold, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God and recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. While he clung to Peter and John, all the people, utterly astounded, ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's. And when Peter saw it, he addressed the people, Men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we have made him walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate when he decided to release him but you denied when you when he had decided to release him but you denied the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you and you killed the author of life whom God raised from the dead to this we are witnesses and his name by faith in his name has made this man strong whom you see and know and the faith that is through Jesus has given this man perfect health in the presence of you all and now brothers I know that you acted in ignorance as did also your rulers but what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets that this Christ would suffer he thus fulfilled repent therefore and turn back that your sins may be blotted out that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. Moses said, The Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. You shall listen to him in whatever he tells you. And it shall be that every soul who does not listen to that prophet shall be destroyed from the people. And all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel and those who came after him also proclaimed these days. You are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant that God made with your fathers, saying to Abraham, and in your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. God, having raised up his servant, sent him to you first to bless you by turning every one of you from your wickedness. For those of you who consider yourselves Christians, followers of Jesus Christ, what does it mean to live out the Christian faith? What does it mean to live like a Christian, to make your way in this world as a Christian? How do you live on mission as a Christian? What does it look like? What does it seem like? What does it feel like? What is the the, the, what is the daily routine of a faithful Christian? I think we sometimes get stuck on that question. I think we, we feel like we want to be living holy lives. If we're Christians, we want to be living faithful lives. And so we make checklists of things that we are supposed to be doing. Uh, did we read our Bible today? Did we pray today? Did we do this? Did we do that? And those things, you know, they can be helpful. There's a danger, though, of course, in in making your faith a checklist faith because the good news about Jesus is that he accomplished for us what we couldn't accomplish on our own. 
if we could make ourselves righteous by all of our good deeds, we wouldn't need Jesus Christ. But I think a more important question, uh, at least for this morning, a, a question that this passage gets to, is not what are the checklists of a faithful Christian life, but how does that Christian life work itself out for the sake of the gospel? And to take kind of a big picture look at that, I think what this passage shows us is that being on mission means living like it's all about Jesus. Being on mission means living like it's all about Jesus. And, and this passage is going to give us a what, a who, and a now what. A what, a who, and a now what. That's, that's my outline. And the passage begins with a rather ordinary fact. It says that, now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. This is an ordinary fact. The, the, the ninth hour is, is nine hours from sunrise. That's how they categorized time. So it was about 3 p.m. The Bible does not prescribe certain times of prayer. All right? but, but it had become traditional among Jews at this point in history to offer prayers at the time of the morning sacrifice, at the time of the evening sacrifice, and at sunset. So what we have here are two religiously observant Jews, Peter and John, going about their daily routine. What they are doing is simply a matter of course of what a faithful, devout, first century Jew might have been doing. So this is presented as very matter of fact. And so, Christian, you are invited into this narrative. Assuming you are a religiously observant person, you're living out the, the Christian life, and, and, and assuming you're not just a Christian in name only, what are your ordinary practices? Perhaps you're walking to work. Perhaps you're reading your Bible at the coffee shop. Perhaps you have your own scheduled time of prayer. Maybe you're mowing your lawn. Maybe you're sipping something cold on your porch. But the entire story kicks off with a routine, everyday occurrence in the lives of Peter and John. I want that to be clear. This would have been their ordinary pattern as faithful, devout religious individuals. And they made their way up to the temple, and they, they literally would have gone up to the temple. They would have climbed upstairs, and, and they would have passed through the court of the Gentiles, which is an enormous square measuring about two football fields by two football fields that surrounded the temple grounds. And it wasn't part of the original temple designs that are recorded in the Old Testament, uh, but it created a huge compound around it. It had been greatly expanded under the, the rule of King Herod. And it was called the court of the Gentiles because since it wasn't part of the temple itself, non-Jews, Gentiles, could enter into that court. And as they went through the court of Gentiles, they likely would have climbed up some further steps. And probably, we, we don't know which gate this was, but most likely this is a, a gate that they're talking about on the eastern side of the temple. And it was called the, the beautiful gate because it was richly ornate, like bronze overlaid with gold, what we have from the historical records. Whoever killed that buzzing, thank you. Um, and that brings us to kind of the presenting problem in this passage, the, the what, the what happened of this passage. We read that, and a, lame, a man lame from birth was being carried whom they lay daily at the gate of the temple that is called the beautiful gate to ask alms of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. So we have this man who's lame or crippled. And in chapter 4 of the book of Acts, we learn that uh, he was believed to have been over 40 years old. So it's been since birth to over 40 years old. So we don't know, you know, we, we don't have a medical history of this patient, uh, whether it was something congenital or whether it was some sort of tragedy in the birthing process. But the short of it is he can't walk. He hasn't been able to walk. White-collar labor 
wasn't really a thing back then. There were just no jobs for a man in this physical condition. Today, he could have gotten a wheelchair, perhaps even a prosthesis. He, he could get an education and, and a job as a teacher or an engineer or a stockbroker. And failing all of that, he could get supplemental security pay, uh, payments from the government to ensure that his basic needs were met. But in the first century, none of that was available. So this man was required to beg for money, at least since he had become an adult, and perhaps for even longer. And so as a result of this situation, Peter and John have their routine interrupted by evil. I don't mean that the man asking is evil. I mean that the condition of the man is evil. I mean, theologians and, and philosophers speak of two different types of evil. We speak of moral evil, and we speak of natural evil. Moral evil is when you break moral laws, uh, things like murder, stealing, lying, adultery, worshiping anyone or anything besides the God, that sort of thing. But we have this category that we call natural evil as well. Natural evil are the things that are wrong with the world. It's brokenness and pain and suffering. It's a hurricane. It's a hailstorm, an earthquake, a birth defect, a, a, a tree limb falling on your car, or a pandemic that has killed more than four and a half million people around the world. They are the things in our world that are no one's fault, at least not in a direct or immediate sense. From a Christian perspective, both moral evil and natural evil are the result of sin. In the beginning, God created a world without sin. It wasn't all a paradise. That's maybe a misunderstanding of what the Bible says. But it was all good. And we were made to be like God. And to bring that good universe under God's good and just rule and turn it into a paradise. But as a result of sin, the Bible says that creation was subject to futility and is in bondage to corruption. Our human parent, our human ancestor, Adam, sinned against God. He rebelled against God. And he brought a curse on creation and the inevitability of death, both a physical death and a spiritual death, death if we're left to our own devices. And so in the Christian accounting of things, moral evil leads to natural evil. Moral evil leads to natural evil. We see that on a macro level with things like pandemics and storms that cause destruction and devastation because the world is fundamentally corrupt. But we also see it on a micro level, don't we? If somebody uses the mind-altering substance, moral evil, that leads to an accident that leaves someone else with chronic physical ailment, a natural evil. For Peter and John, this evil that confronted them, this, again, not the man himself, being evil, but the condition that he was in was an evil. But this evil that confronted them and interrupted their routine wasn't an inconvenience to their routine. They weren't worried that they were going to be late to the prayer service. They weren't annoyed by a conversation that they didn't want to have. Instead, they focused their attention on the man and instructed the man to pay attention to them. The text says that the man responded. He was expecting to receive a gift. One scholar thinks that he probably assumed that by them asking him to pay attention, oh, he's like, oh, this is going to be a good one. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to really cash in with these guys. And that makes sense. It's one thing to toss some coins in the, the lap of a beggar as you walk by and it's quite another to stop and take the time to talk, isn't it? But Peter surprises this man when he starts off by saying, I have no silver or gold. Peter had no money. Which is funny, isn't it? Because, you know, the, the healers I see on TV 
have a lot of money. Some even brag about it. Some insist that it's a sign that God has blessed them and that they have great faithfulness. But here's the apostle Peter, one of the twelve who was with Jesus on the mountain, who was with Jesus in the garden, who watched Jesus' trial at a distance, who ate breakfast with Jesus on the beach, and he's penniless. He's penniless. He has no money. Riches are not a sure sign of blessing. And the one who wants to follow Jesus must be prepared to give up everything to follow him. But Peter has something better than money. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk, he says. He takes the man by the hand. He helps him up, and the man is well. Now, a healing at all is without a doubt amazing. But consider just how amazing this miracle was. This man had been in this condition for over 40 years and since birth. That means... Of course, that whatever the physical deformity or condition was that prevented him from walking was removed. But also, consider how his muscles must have atrophied from lack of use. He had to be carried into the temple and placed in this spot on the daily. So not only was the underlying issue remedied, but the man was made strong. But something else. We don't know if this man was completely incapable of walking and had been his entire life or if he was just functionally unable to walk, like not able to you know, walk any amount of distance, not be able to walk upstairs to the temple and things like that. But on some level, this man would have needed time to relearn how to walk. Anyone who's been through physical therapy or known anyone who's gone through physical therapy, especially with their legs, they take time to learn how to walk. Those Behaviors can take weeks to relearn. And yet this man can do it immediately. In fact, he's leaping. And so this is total healing. When Peter says, Jesus has given this man perfect health in the presence of you all, think about what that means. He's fixed the deformity. He's strengthened the muscles and given him the mental understanding of what it takes to put one leg in front of another. That is an amazing miracle. But there's something else that we should note about this healing because I don't think it takes place the way we tend to assume things like this are supposed to take place. You know, often when Jesus was walking the earth, people had great faith in him and went to him for healing. They knew or they had come to believe that he could heal, and so they sought him out for healing. But this man didn't seek out the apostles. He didn't come to that gate because he knew there was apostles there who could heal him. He wasn't seeking a healing. He was seeking money. So he didn't come into this scenario with great faith to be healed it was just a divine encounter in fact peter needs to tell the man who jesus is jesus a man from nazareth is the christ or from this man's perspective we would say he was the long-awaited jewish messiah christ is the greek translation of messiah You know, the TV guys will tell you that you have to have great faith to be healed. And that if you're not healed, it's because you don't have enough faith. Mm -mm. It's not what happens here, is it? This man didn't ask to be healed. He didn't expect to be healed by faith. He did not sow a seed offering or give any sort of gift in order to be healed. There were probably many beggars in the temple that day, but this one was healed. So the man is walking and leaping and praising God, and and that leads the people in the temple to take note of this man that they recognized. And they were no doubt confused. What's going on here? And all of this takes place because Peter 
and John were going about their day as faithful, devout Christians and took the opportunity to address the brokenness of the world that crossed their path. What does that mean for you, Mr. or Ms. Christian? Well, I'm certainly not saying that you should go down to public square, look around for a person with a physical malady, and then try to heal them in Jesus' name. First, the gift of healing is not given to every Christian. The Apostle Paul makes that very clear. Second, John and Peter knows they weren't going around looking for people to heal. They were going to pray at the normal time that they prayed every day. Third, this wasn't a special mission. Instead, what we should take away from this is that in the course of living out faithful Christian lives, we will inevitably encounter brokenness in this world. And attending to that brokenness, instead of ignoring it, will lead to opportunities to glorify Jesus. Attending to the brokenness of this world will lead to opportunities to glorify Jesus. So while you might not have the gift of healing, you have some other gift of the Spirit or some other blessing of God that might be used to heal how resourceful or how smart you are. What do you do with that? Do you mutter a thank you? And, and, and take the accolades. Now there's definitely something to be said for being able to humbly but confidently receive a compliment. That's just part of being a healthy adult. But notice what Peter says. Men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we have made him walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate when he first words, his opening words here. First, he gives all the credit to God. He gives all the credit to Jesus for the healing. In fact, Peter explicitly says that the healing had nothing to do with his and John's power or piety. Peter and John did not have some unique power in themselves. Whatever power was on display was God's power, not their own. They had not found some secret way to tap into the energy of the universe. They had no magical abilities. They don't even claim here a particularly special connection with God. Simply put, this is all about Jesus. And on that, on that theme, he says, <clears throat> it also had nothing to do with their personal piety. That is, their religious devotion or their faithfulness. I, I think that we're sometimes under the mistaken impression that the apostles, for example, did these great miracles because they were super holy or because they were super spiritual. But Peter explicitly states that it's not about that. It's not about their super spiritualness. Why did God choose Peter and John to be the channel of his healing power on that beggar? Only God knows. Because this was God's work and not man's. The fact that this beggar was healed through God's servants, Peter and John, was God's doing. It wasn't because Peter and John were super holy. They may have been. But that wasn't the reason for the healing. There's a second thing that Peter's words teach us. <clears throat> the purpose of the healing was to glorify Jesus. Now to glorify someone is to bring them honor, to bring them fame. So Peter's point is that this beggar was healed in order to bring Jesus more honor and more fame. So Jesus couldn't be a background player in this good deed. Jesus needed to be front and center in this good deed. The man wasn't healed so that Peter would become well-known, so that Peter would become the next 
rock star rabbi in Jerusalem. The man was healed so that the people would hear and the world would hear about Jesus and they would give glory to Jesus. And so that's exactly what Peter proceeds to do. A good work done in the name of Jesus in answer to the brokenness of this world becomes the opportunity to make Jesus famous. A good work done in the name of Jesus in answer to the brokenness of this world becomes an opportunity to make Jesus famous. Peter is speaking to a Jewish audience. He's speaking in the temple in Jerusalem. And at this point, the Christian movement is entirely an ethnically Jewish one. His listeners have come to worship in the temple. So they are also likely devout religious Jews. And Peter makes clear that what they are witnessing is a distinctly Jewish phenomenon. And he does that by referencing the religious history of the Hebrew people. By referring to God as the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, Peter's indicating that the Jews, the the God that they worship is the the same God that he worships. He's saying, I'm a Jew. I worship the same God as you and the same God as our Hebrew ancestors. So he's laying the groundwork here. This is part of it, guys. This is part of our shared history. He says that Jesus was God's servant. And that's a title that's used in the Old Testament for some of the most important figures of the Old Testament, like King David and the prophet Isaiah. But it's also used of a promised future servant who would do the will of God on earth, the Messiah. And so he's establishing Jesus as important in God's plan, as God's promised Messiah. But he does more than that. Peter's going to accuse the crowd of a number of really serious and grave moral evils, sins. Peter tells the story of Jesus' arrest and trial and crucifixion. But he lays the blame at the feet of his audience. They delivered God's servant to the pagan Roman emperor, or governor, excuse me, Pilate. Even though Jesus was holy and righteous, and even though Pilate gave them the opportunity to spare Jesus' life by releasing a prisoner of their choosing, they chose to have Jesus killed and a murderer released from prison. Why could Peter make these strong claims? Did he recognize the men in the temple that day? From Jesus' trial? No, I I don't think so. Instead, Peter knows that Jesus died on account of sin. Jesus died in the place of sinners. Jesus died to pay for our moral evil. And so there's a real sense in which you killed Jesus and I killed Jesus and Pilate killed Jesus and Joe Biden killed Jesus and Kim Jong-un killed Jesus and it's ironic Peter said because we they killed the author of life Sin brought death into the world. Uh, Sin is like the virus that causes the disease that we call death. And that death is both physical and spiritual. But Jesus is the antidote. He is the remedy. He is life. And as the author of life, death could not defeat him. God raised him from the dead. And it's no wonder then that from heaven, Jesus could take a man's feet and legs, which were as good as dead, and restore them to life because he is the author of life. Now, I said earlier that 
the miracle had nothing to do with the great faithfulness of the apostles or the great faith of the cripple. But that doesn't mean faith wasn't involved. God works through faith. Peter had faith in Jesus. And through Jesus, faith came to this invalid. It may have been a mustard seed of faith, And the man may not have necessarily known the whole story about Jesus, although he's clinging to Peter right now, right? He's clinging to Peter and John right now, so he's hearing. But he knew that Jesus was able to heal. Faith leads to faith. Faithful action on the part of the apostles led to faith in this man. And faith is the work that God desires. So speaking of himself, Jesus had previously said while he was walking in ministry on earth, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. You want to know what work God desires to be right with him? Believe in Jesus. And with that, Peter has explained what this encounter was all about. It was all about Jesus and the power that's in his name. This happened to glorify Jesus. It happened to make Jesus known. And now Peter has taken the opportunity to spread Jesus' fame even further. So a man was healed. That's what happened. And the healing happened by the power of Jesus for the sake of Jesus. That's The who. So now what? Peter can't leave things there. A man was healed. The man was healed by Jesus, but so what? That's an important question. Now you can either accept these two facts, that a man was healed and he was healed by Jesus, or you can can accept those as historical fact, historical reality, or you can reject them. But if you accept them, if you acknowledge that they happened and this audience that Peter was speaking to had to accept that this man was healed, they should motivate something. You can't simply coexist in your soul with a Jesus like this and not do something with him. You have to do something with facts like this. But what do you do? Well, Peter tells his listeners plainly that what happened in Jerusalem several weeks before the murder of God's servant Jesus was done in ignorance. The people didn't believe, let alone know who Jesus was. Doesn't excuse their sin, but even if it did excuse their sin, they wouldn't have been able to use that as an excuse because uh, uh, Peter Peter was now telling them plainly what they had done. So the excuse is going to be kind of wiped out. It was one thing to not know that Jesus was the author of life and then support his death. It's quite another to know that Jesus is the author of life and still reject him. And so now there's an obligation. When you know that information, there's an obligation that comes with it. And that obligation is repentance. We've said it before. I'll say it a thousand times before I die. I'm sure repentance is turning. It's turning. It means turning away from rejecting Jesus and turning toward accepting Jesus. It means turning from following after the world or some fruitless spiritual path and turning toward following Jesus. And that turning comes with an ethical dimension. It's a Turning from wickedness, Peter says in verse 26. Back to the righteous and holy one whom we had previously rejected. And this repentance comes with a promise and it comes with an urgency. The promise is times of refreshing from the presence of the Lord. Jesus, the author of life, will give you new life by his spirit. He will restore your spiritual life and give you peace that you are accepted in the eyes of God. It's not a promise that everything will go well in this life, but it is a promise that life is fundamentally and radically changed. It is 
refreshed. Like cool water on a hot day. There are going to be hot days. There will be scorching, nearly unbearable heat. But we'll be livened by the Spirit's power within us. And in the end of all things, the author of life will return so that we will be made completely new. And like him, we will defeat death. But Jesus' return is a double-edged sword that brings an urgency to Peter's words. Peter points to the messages of the great Hebrew prophets. God had promised through Moses that there would be another prophet like him to whom God's people must obey. Jesus, he says, is that prophet. Jesus is the one we must now obey. And if not, Peter says, we know the Old Testament scriptures. He says to his audience, those who don't obey will be destroyed. So Jesus' return from heaven is both a sweet comfort and the fullness of eternal life to those who repent and follow him. And it's utter destruction for those who continue to reject him. Peter reminds us that God had promised to bless all the families of the earth through the descendant, the seed of the Jewish patriarch Abraham. That descendant, Jesus, is now revealed. And so Peter's audience and us here today must decide whether we will enter that blessing by faith or reject it. If you are not a Christian, that path of blessing and times of refreshing and life from Jesus stands before you. You can choose the course you're presently on. You can choose some other course that comes along down the line. But these are paths that inevitably end in destruction. The only path to life is the one that follows the author of life. And it's a path you can take even now by simply having faith. That means by, by believing that Jesus was God's servant who died to pay for your moral failures and your rebellion against God. And that he rose from the dead to give life and that he is coming to judge the world and so you have to answer to him. So in trusting him, in trusting him, you are trusting that his ways are better than your ways. And so you follow him. And so you follow him. And if you do that, you receive his promises. For the Christian here, I, I, I want you to see how the Christian life is all about Jesus. And in living out the Christian life, in living out a life that's all about Jesus, we see a simple pattern for bringing the truth of Jesus to a world trapped in sin. I believe there's a model here that we can faithfully follow. First, we do good by the power of the Spirit in the name of Jesus. We do good by the power of the Spirit in the name of Jesus. That probably won't mean for you doing miraculous healings. Maybe it will. But it's okay if it's not. The Spirit has empowered you in various unique ways. And as you carry on an ordinary, faithful Christian life, you will certainly encounter the brokenness of the world. And you will be in a position, you will be in a position to step in and bring relief in the ways that God has given you. 
And so you'll have that opportunity to do good by Christ's Spirit in the name of Jesus. Second, we point to Jesus. We want people to know that it is Jesus who makes our service possible. It's Jesus who heals wounds and restores brokenness. It's not fundamentally about me. It's not fundamentally about us. It's fundamentally about Jesus. We can maturely receive a compliment. Well, I appreciate you saying how nice I am. But let me explain to you that the reason why I have done this is because Jesus has so moved in me to be able to do this. I don't do this fundamentally because I'm such a good person. I don't do this fundamentally because I'm so smart or so wise or so rich. I do this because Jesus has transformed me and empowered me to be able to do this. And so we redirect and we, we show people that the true source, the true power behind any honestly good deed we do is Jesus. And third, we give them the so what. We explain to people that Jesus demands a response. You can reject him or you can accept him. There are consequences to both. But you cannot be ambivalent about Jesus. There is no third way. There is no neutral ground with Jesus. If Jesus is Lord of all, if he is enthroned in heaven and crowned King of kings, then we owe an allegiance to him. And to fail to give him that allegiance, no matter what that looks like, is rebellion. There's no middle ground. There is no neutral. There is no Switzerland. There is only with him or not with him. Ambivalence to the author of life is real hostility. And so there's an urgency to our message. We don't, we don't twist arms and we don't manipulate people and we don't trick people. In fact, we can't even convince people that we're right. That's the Spirit's job. The Spirit convicts people of the truth of the message. But we do want people to know that if there is a Jesus who was crucified for sin, who defeated sin and death by being resurrected from the grave, who has ascended to heaven so that he can pour out his spirit on us so that we can be empowered to do these good things in Jesus' name, then there's something you need to do with those facts. And that choice matters. If we consistently lived out this pattern, I'm convinced Cleveland would know all about Jesus in no time. I'm not saying that all of Cleveland would worship Jesus, but all of Cleveland would know his name and what he truly has done and what he stands for. And not just Cleveland, but the ends of the world. We do good in our ordinary lives. We do good by the power of the Spirit. We point to Jesus as the source of that power. And we explain to people that what they do with Jesus matters. Let's give that a shot. Father in heaven, We thank you, God, that you have given us your spirit, and by your spirit you have renewed us and refreshed us, and you have given us life and power. And we thank you, God, for the good works that we see by your spirit 
in our midst. Forgive us, Father, for the times that we've allowed ourselves and our church and our community to, to take credit for your goodness and your power instead of using it to show people that you, your son Jesus, is the source of that power. And it's to him that we owe allegiance. Give us the strength by your spirit to not cease doing good, but also empower us by your spirit to speak the goodness of the gospel in the midst of those good works. And Father, for those who have not yet put their trust in Jesus, truly, honestly, faithfully, for those who maybe have deluded themselves into thinking that they are followers of Jesus, but their lives bear no evidence of repentance. May they recognize that that's the choice that they have before them. That there are no followers of Jesus who ignore Jesus, who are ambivalent toward Jesus. And may repentance and refreshing come to them today. So in Jesus' name we pray, amen.